architecture. And um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Marina Alexandrova, uh, PhD, an expert in Russian history, culture, and language. And, uh, and the connections with um, Blavatsky and the Philosophical Society. So we're really looking forward to hear your take on, uh, on this topic, which is the making of a global community, Blavatsky's travel logs from 19, 1879 to uh, 1886. Very interesting period. So um, the word is yours, Marina. Thank you so much. And it's a great pleasure to be here. And um, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to uh, hearing your questions and feedback after I um, read my paper, uh, because it's a part of an ongoing project, a book length project about uh, Russian legacy of Madame Blavatsky. So uh, my paper situates Blavatsky's three works written in Russian about India, the mysterious tribes of the Blue Mountains, Durbar of Lahore, and from the caves of jungles of Hindustan in the context of Russian travel literature and explores her use of themes and tropes that belong to this popular genre as well as some of her innovations. In addition, I argue that by introducing her Russian readership to Indian culture and spirituality, Blavatsky not only fostered a better understanding of India, but used it as an opportunity to dismantle stereotypes about the country and reveal deep similarities between India and Russia, the seemingly disparate cultures. This work, I argue, um, she does in service of Theosophy's chief goals to build a global community of spiritual seekers. I argue also that when we consider Blavatsky's Russian language literary endeavors within the context of the censorship taking place in the late 19th century Russia, a condition that was unimaginable in the United States and Western Europe of that time, her literary accomplishments stand out as all the more remarkable. The success of Helena Petrovna Blavatsky's travel narratives, especially from the caves and jungles of Hindustan, the letters to fatherland, published between 1879 and 1886 in two major Russian periodicals, was not surprising given Blavatsky's outstanding talent as a writer, the fascinating ethnographic and cultural material she presented, and the popularity of the genre of travelogue in Russia at that time. As a powerful tool of imperial imagination and national self-knowledge, Russian travel narratives fully emerged as an independent genre in the 18th century and generally belonged to one of two classes. On the one hand, they were the relatively dry descriptions of travel in Russia and abroad by professional geographers, merchants, military personnel, diplomats, and others at the service of the state. And on the other hand, were travelogues that belonged to a literary genre, which often pursued a variety of goals, including aesthetic, philosophical, educational, and political ones. Both types started gaining prominence and popularity for their descriptive and interpretive content at the end of the 18th century. And while not developing in a vacuum, European travelogues definitely provided inspiration, Russian travel narratives became distinct testaments of national self-definition in relation to other nations and culture, cultures and revealed the cultural and political anxieties of a rapidly changing and modernizing empire with grand geopolitical ambitions. As I show in this talk, Blavatsky's hybrid travel narratives make use of certain features of Russian travelogues of both types, but they also depart radically from previous travelogues, both in contact and in aim. As we will see, Blavatsky sought to dismantle, oh, sorry, disseminate theosophical knowledge in the context of severely restricted freedom of speech and religion, and through um, the only outlet available to her, which was literary journals. Before the publication of Blavatsky's travelogues, Russian travel narratives about India existed only in the first non-literary category of writing and gained popularity with Russian readers because of the exoticism of the travelers' adventures rather than their literary merits. The first known Russian travelogue about India, Afanasy Nikitin's A Journey Beyond the Three Seas, um, published in 1475, was a diary that told of his adventures and misadventures in India in the 1470s. Surprising for a diary of a provincial merchant, preoccupations about preserving or losing one's faith were one of the main late motifs. And the addition of a prayer in broken Arabic at the end suggests that Nikitin might have converted to Islam. Given his, this preoccupation with religion in the and the narrative's popularity, it comes as no surprise that out of the many uh, so-called journeys to India, Blavatsky could have mentioned, she chose to reference Nikitin's diary. Uh, with its approving descriptions of various faiths and an implicit statement of their equal validity. 
One could even speculate that there exists a certain spiritual affinity between two authors that Blavatsky wanted to emphasize by alluding to Nikitin's journey, even though she doesn't specifically address his views on religion. Like in Nikitin's early narrative, spiritual preoccupations and comparisons were at the heart of most Russian travel narratives about India. And in that sense, Blavatsky's writings continued this tradition. Suffice it to mention the highly popular autobiographical work by Filip Yefremov, The Nine Year Journey, published in 1784, in which he documented his adventures in Central Asia, Persia, and India, ranging from enslavement and torture intended to pressure him into converting to Islam, to becoming a commander of a small army, all the while allegedly holding fast um, onto his Orthodox faith, and only occasionally disguising himself as a Muslim or a Buddhist pilgrim. While Yefremov's experiences were brought about by a series of unintentional misfortunes, Gerasim Lebedev's writings resulted from his conscious desire to immerse himself in the study of Indian culture, languages, and religious traditions. Considered to be the first Russian Indologist, Lebedev mastered the Bengali language, created the first European-style theater where he staged English plays in his own Bengali translations, and wrote several works on grammar, music, folklore, religion, and other aspects of Indian culture. It is likely that Blavatsky had access to his um, book uh, called Impartial Contemplation of the Brahmin Systems of East India, Their Sacred Rites and Folk Customs, published in 1805, in which he described a wide range of Brahmin teachings and practices, argued that Christianity and Hinduism share core teachings. For example, he says that Krishna is Christ and revealed himself to be one of the first Westerners to insist on the importance of studying India and its rich cultural and spiritual traditions. Lebedev's reasons for disseminating spiritual knowledge he acquired in India reads like an early version of the mission of the Theosophical Society some 70 years prior to its creation. And I quote, it makes a union in the human race scattered across the face of the earth, spreads in the universe the true understanding and knowledge of God, right belief and law, reinforces the mutual connection of the friendliness desired between people, and unites the ability to restore the common and universal good. End quote. While Lebedev's works do contain anti-British sentiment, and for a good reason, since his disagreements with local British authorities led to the destruction of his theater and loss of livelihood, also kind of foreshadowing Lovatsky's troubles in India, no one was as vocal about the abuses of the British colonial system as the poet, writer, and government employee as Alexander Rochev whose own service at the, as the head administrator of Fort Ross in California might have something to do with his vitriolic critique of British mismanagement of their colonies. His 1854 impassioned 400-page expose of the horrors of the British colonial rule, entitled The Truth About England and Tales About the Expansion of Her Possessions in All Parts of the World, published by the Imperial Academy of Science, was an instant success because of Rochev's superb literary style, his vast international experience, and the propitious time for its publication. At this time, Russia was embroiled in the disastrous Crimean War and the anti-British sentiment was at all time high. Because of, its or because of the proliferation of such fiery diatribes in the Russian press, Blavatsky's readers were primed to listen to her many descriptions of the abuses of British colonial rule. Even in their English translations, Blavatsky's Russian language travelogues present a unique blend of narrative styles humorous, lyrical, self-deprecating, matter of fact, indignant, and so on, and stands in stark contrast to, their, to her esoteric works in English. Some well-known 18th century Russian travel narratives like Dmitry Van Vizian's Letters from France, published in 1806, and Nikolai Karamzian's Letter of a Russian Traveler, published in 1791, may have provided inspiration for such a variety of modalities within, or with her intimate subjective authorial voice, a strong sense of Russian national identity and poignant, often, often scathingly critical commentary on observed customs and mores. However, it was Ivan Gencherov's innovative and highly popular epistolary travelogue, Frigate Palada, Circumnavigation Sketches, published in 1855, that was perhaps the closest predecessor of Blavatsky's unique works. Frigate Palada's generic hybridity, it was variously considered a geography manual, an adventure novel, an ethnographic study, a personal diary, young adult literature, and so on, rivals that of Blavatsky's works. But the Serkov refused to call her writings travelogues because of their non-chronological nature and the introduction of elements that he calls entirely fictitious. 
collated from several journeys and replete with novelistic descriptions of character interactions, Caves and Jungles contained reliable ethnographic and cultural information borrowed from Thornton's Gazetteer of India and various guidebooks. Together with heroes and heroines, she evolved, quote, um, out of her fancy as does any other author. There are no more than gilt upholstery nails to hold her descriptive tapestry together. And that's Blavatsky talking about herself in third person. Even if Blavatsky downplayed the importance of those so-called gilt upholstery nails, I would like to emphasize that those characters might be, in fact, one of the main reasons for the creation of these travelogues. And from the point of view of her theosophical mission, these travel notes were her only chance to acquaint wider Russian readership with key theosophical concepts and figures, including introducing her readers to the so-called masters. Indeed, the caves was the first official introduction of the masters to her Russian audiences, in the character of Gulab Lal Singh, quote, a tall Rajput, an independent Takur from the province of Rajasthan, end quote. The narrator tells us that, quote, he belonged to the sect of Raja Yogins, initiated into the mysteries of magic, alchemy, and various other occult sciences in India. He was rich and independent, and rumor did not dare to suspect him of deception, the more so because even if he actually delved into these sciences, he carefully concealed this knowledge from all of, but his closer friends, end quote. Some 400 pages later comes a crucial passage that reveals that just how important this character is to the group. The readers learn that he was not just a friend and a guide. Some members of the group actually sought to be his disciples. Um, quote, we came to India across the distance of 10,000 miles to study psychology and all that relates to the spiritual being of a man and in compliance with your call. We chose you as your guru, teacher, and now that we have discovered in you alone, the embodiment of the secret science, will you turn away from us? And that's Blavatsky describing what Olcott uh, said. After an emotionally charged exchange, Gulab Singh agrees to subject Colonel Olcott to a test that would determine if he is fit to become his cello or disciple. To someone familiar with the teachings of theosophy, Gulab Lal Singh, endowed with mysterious powers from his strikingly youthful appearance to the ability to suddenly appear and disappear and convey his thoughts at a distance using the boundless space of Akasha, is clearly one of the theosophical masters, Blavatsky's teacher Moria. Two moments deserve special consideration here. First, the narrator never states that she intended to become a cella, and, but demonstrates that the process would look like for an earnest seeker of truth, starting with a call and, if deserving, resulting in a seven-year apprenticeship. Second, the accounts of interactions with the Gulab Lal Singh are presented in all seriousness, but surrounded with lighthearted vignettes depicting the group in almost humorous terms as gullible Westerners giving money away to a charlatan posing as a sage or trying to perform Hatha yoga while lacking physical abilities for it. And that was the critique of Alcott. In that way, Blavatsky masterfully embedded key theosophical ideas into otherwise entertaining material. Blavatsky's shorter travel pieces, the Durbar and Lahore from the Diary of a Russian and the Enigmatical Tribes of the Blue Hills of India were also published in Katkov's periodicals in 1881 and between 1884 and 85 respectively. The Enigmatical Tribes opens with a reference to an article in a major English newspaper that accused the Russians of ignorance about Rus India and sets out to prove that Russians know more than the British about India. In the preface, the narrator cleverly states that at the risk of angering materialists, she still needs to stick to the facts and talk about the inexplicable events and supernatural powers demonstrated by the Toda and Kurumba tribes of the then barely accessible Nilgiri mountains. A scathing critique of British colonial rule peppered with colorful tales of local lore with excerpts, excerpts from 19th century British reports about their contacts with locals, the first chapters of the enigmatical tribes show more affinity with Rochev's diatribes than caves and jungles. Only in chapter three, the author turns to her own impressions of the tribes and then uses her observations to compare and contrast the tribe's access to powers and energies that were hard to explain from material's point of view. Blavatsky draws parallels between Todas and Kurumba's magic or sorcery in quotation marks and European experiments in hypnotism, arguing that both phenomena are fundamentally the same. But the most fascinating part is the conclusion where the author argues that magic is an observable psychophysiological phenomenon, just like hypnotism. And again, we're think, we're, you have to remember that this is written for Russian audiences and um, that kind of um, exploration of the topics of sorcery um, wasn't really available or possible in open press. So she will, has to be really, really careful how she presents those debates. 
Um, she warns of the dangers of some evil-minded magnetizers, as she calls them, and claims that they are the same as evil sorcerers in various traditions, if not worse. Um, and then there is the Dubar in Lahore, and even though the goal of the trip uh, to Lahore was the establishment of a new branch of Theosophical Society, Russian readers are presented with a detailed description of Amrit Sarm and Sikhism without the mention of Theosophical um, Society or the real goals um, of our characters there. Um, due to restrictions in time, I, I cannot go um, further into this, but um, let's turn to the question, why did Blavatsky resort to scattering uh, the theosophical jewels throughout her na travel narratives? And why was she much less upfront about the teachers, her connection to them, and other aspects of theosophical theory and practice than she was in her English language works? In short, the answer is censorship. Many of you might know this, but some of you might not. So I will pause here to give a brief historical background about the culture of publishing in Russia at this time, and will help that will help explain the peculiarities of style in Blavatsky's Russian works. The publication of Blavatsky's travel narratives in Mikhail Katkov's periodicals spanned the rule of two Russian Tsars, Alexander II and III, two quite different epochs from the point of view of freedom of speech and regulations concerning the publishing industry. A well-known conservative by the time Blavatsky published in his periodicals, Katkov started off as an Anglophile in favor of Alexander II's sweeping reforms, but abandoned his views, eventually becoming one of the pillars of the so-called or preservationist movement, a movement that sought to reinforce the belief in autocracy as the only suitable and natural form of government for Russia. <clears throat> in the centrality of Russian Orthodox Christianity to Russian way of life and the elusive concept of narodnost, often translated as peopleness or national unity. First coined by the Minister of Education, Sergei Ovarov, in 1833, this tripartite concept became the foundation for the ideological doctrine of official nationality, endorsed by the highly conservative Tsar Alexander, I'm sorry, um, Nicholas I, and rulers after him. The doctrine, as an antithesis to liberté, égalité, fraternité, also meant the implementation of a wide range of measures designed to thwart the threats to the regime, both internal and external. An elaborate system of censorship was set in place, culminating in the period of so-called censorship terror between 1848 and 1855, when dissemination of any ideas that could potentially challenge any of these three pillars of the doctrine became virtually impossible. While not as severe as the policies of Nicholas I, publishing restrictions under Tsar reformer Alexander I still severely limited the publishing industry. The 1865 censorship reform instituted punitive censorship instead of preliminary one, which meant that publishers had to submit proofs of already printed periodicals and, in case of any suspicious material, face delays, fines, arrests, and administrative consequences. The difference between the two types of um, censorship was formulated by a famous Russian writer, Siltikov Shedrin, as follows, quote, preliminary censorship was com comparable to a muzzle that is put on a dog. You want to bite, but it's impossible. The position of literature under punitive censorship was compared with bears, which are led by gypsies at fairs. Theoretically, you can bite, but the teeth of the bear are sewn off. There is a ring in the nose, which the leader is re ready to pull at any moment. Besides, he painfully hits his paws with a stick, end quote. After the assassination of Alexander II in 1881, the new set of temporary measures that actually were in effect until 1905 made it possible for the Minister of Internal Affairs or by the Holy Synod, which is the kind of the governing, governing body over Russian Orthodox Church, to shut down any suspicious periodical as part of the conservative counter reforms of Alexander III. While the extreme censorship of the Nikolaevan Russia might have been a thing of the past. Even Kankov's strong, Katkov's strong connections in the highest echelons of power, including the Tsar Alexander III and his close advisor, Konstantin Pobedanosov, did not safeguard Katkov's politically reliable and patriotic periodicals from occasional harassment from the censors. Given the fact that Blavatsky valued Katkov so highly as a friend, as a patriot, and an indefatigable supporter of Russia's internal and external interests, it only makes sense that she would exercise extreme caution when discussing matters of religion and politics in her travelogue. To summarize and conclude Blavatsky's multi-layered, informative, and structurally complex travel narratives written for her Russian readers successfully accomplished a number of tasks. They acquainted Russians with the rich cultural and spiritual legacy of India, introduced important tenets of theosophy, and established Blavatsky's reputation as a brilliant writer, 
while taking into consideration strict censorship laws of the Tsarist government and political climate in Russia. Thank you.